This is the image the city of Glasgow wants to project to the outside world. A city full of energy, life and with ambitious plans for the 21st century. But Glasgow, and indeed Scotland, also have another image they desperately want to shed. Religious hatred. Now, it's still quite early. It's two o'clock in the morning. How do you expect the evening to pan out? We've got a list here from the computer, and we know we've had 14 assaults in before midnight. That's a high number for a weekend. At the end of the day, you could be talking about 40 patients. We've all, been, all come here as a result of... Um, sectarian problems. This is a film about two communities, one Protestant, the other Catholic, and the centuries-old rivalry between them. It's also a film about two of the biggest football clubs in the world, and about violence where wearing the wrong colour can mark you out for attack, even death. And this in Britain in the 21st century. song sung by generations of Protestants in Scotland. It refers to the murder of Irish Catholics in battles 400 years ago. Glasgow Rangers fans sing it to antagonise their rivals, Glasgow Celtic. This is no ordinary football rivalry. It's the result of deep religious division. Celtic's traditional support is Catholic and Rangers Protestant. We filmed with paramedics and hospital staff after last weekend's Rangers and Celtic game. Most of the injuries you see in this programme were filmed on just that one night. This man was attacked several hours after the match. I'm a regular at Celtic and Rangers games. Regular. I got a ticket usually every game. This week I decided not to watch watch a game in the pub with my pals. This is what happens. Which makes you wonder, you know what I mean? There was sectarian stuff, no? Turned round. That was that. Didn't they say anything? My teeth kicked in. My hand jumped on. It's all about people getting put in hospital because of team this sport. What's going on this, this country? Rangers and Celtic are known as the old firm. They're among the top 20 richest football clubs in the world. One city, two footballing giants, and a rivalry which stems historically from the religious conflicts between Protestant Ulster and Catholic Ireland. We've got a small, very small section of the fan base that, uh, that I think uh, we would rather not have associated with the club, who are sectarian attitudes. But I think you have to see that in context, historical context in particular. I think we've made enormous strides in dealing with that, trying to prevent it in the first case and to eradicate it in the second case. So our policy is very clear. We discourage sectarian behaviour in any form. Do you believe that you do have a sectarian fan base? Very small, and I think it would be wrong of me and crass of me to die there is not some unacceptable fans who support our club. But I genuinely believe it's a minority, it's improving, but we should never be complacent and hopefully that one day it can be totally eradicated. This perception of the scale of the problem isn't shared by those who work in A&E. If people who don't <laughs> understand it, down south it would probably be like if you had an all-black team and an all-white team, and the all-black team were only supported by blacks, and the all-white team were only supported by whites. And that's the only way you could really explain it, where there was that type of violence out in the street. 
that's what it's like up here. It's, it's not a colour of skin, it's, it's a religion. It's an analogy shared by one of the few journalists in Scotland to have openly criticised the clubs for failing to tackle the issue. I've tried this line out on, on some of the more bigoted members of the Rangers and Celtic support and they don't get it. You say, you know these phrases that you enjoy, these shouts and these chants you enjoy, dirty orange bastard, dirty Fenian bastard. Imagine if it was actually dirty black bastard, there's no doubt about it. If it was rank racism as opposed to rank bigotry, I think it would have been cured long ago because we would never have accepted it. It would have been just too embarrassing. This is the sound of racism in football. Football's world governing body, FIFA, has demanded an explanation from the Spanish authorities for the racist abuse directed at England's black players during last night's match in Madrid. It's only a few months since there was international condemnation of this behaviour. But no such condemnation for singing such as this. Rangers fans baiting their Celtic rivals only last week. In fact, as we travelled to games across Scotland this year, we heard the same songs and chants over and over again. The Billy Boys, clearly the Rangers fans' favourite. But these fans could now be arrested for singing this song. Since June 2003, sectarianism in Scotland has been outlawed. If someone commits an offence, such as an assault or uses abusive language, and it's based on religious prejudice, it's now treated as a sectarian crime. 450 people have been arrested in the first 14 months of the law. But sectarianism goes well beyond what we see on the terraces. It's 11 o'clock on a cold Saturday morning in January. This is a Republican march to commemorate Bloody Sunday in Northern Ireland in 1972. These are scenes you might expect to see on the streets of Belfast or Londonderry. But this is Glasgow, 2005. In about 1800, Scotland was overwhelmingly a Protestant nation. Then the Great Migration started from Ireland. Um, probably a quarter of a million first-generation Irish in Scotland by the end of the 19th century. The important point to remember is that this is not simply a movement of Catholic Irish, because Scotland's Irish came from the north of Ireland. There was a substantial minority also of Protestant people. So to some extent, the north of Ireland's traditional tribal divides, tribal conflicts, what if you like, transferred to Scotland. These deeply rooted religious divisions find particular expression in football. Many Protestant immigrants from Northern Ireland adopted Rangers as their club. They maintained their loyalties to Ulster and the Crown. The club itself didn't sign any Catholic players until 1989. Celtic Football Club was founded more than a hundred years ago by an Irish Catholic priest. Over the years, it's maintained its links with the Irish Republic. I remember vividly the Irish ambassador to the UK attending his first Old Firm match. He thought he was at an international game because on one side of the park, the Irish tri tricolour, uh, the Republic of Ireland, on the other side, the Red Hand of Ulster. It was almost, if you like, a metaphor for the fact that Irish problems had been transferred onto Scottish soil. This Rangers fan was attacked in the street after last weekend's Old Firm game by two men whom he says were wearing Celtic tops. I say, Chris, I need a chance, you know. Not a chance to what you're doing or anything like that. Just 
the boy just threw a swipe at me and he, he caught Chris. If it would be an inch under, I'd have killed him. An inch below to see that it would have killed him, he'd have been dead. See, this is the kind of things we're talking about. This is... How would you feel? How would you feel if it was one of your sons or daughters or one of your mates? A fan was shot and badly injured today with a crossbow bolt on the city's south side. A teenager who murdered his next door neighbour by stabbing him 150 times for wearing a Celtic strip. Detectives appealed for witnesses to the attack. Police insider said there was little doubt it was a potentially murderous attack on the supporter. For generations, Scotland has been in denial about um, this problem of sectarianism. God's sake, it's 200 years old. It is actually embedded very strongly within the culture particularly the culture of the west of Scotland. And so it's so familiar, it's so routine, that people don't actually think or have not thought until recently it's a big issue. It's a fact of life. It's part of the way of life of the society. But now, for the first time in generations, there are moves on the political front to tackle sectarianism. Taking the initiative is Jack McConnell, Scotland's first minister. He described religious bigotry as Scotland's secret shame, upsetting a lot of people. If people think that, uh, that it's wrong that I've got a, a wife who was brought up in a Catholic family or um, they think it's wrong that I am not a Catholic, uh, then uh, um, you know, the other ones that are wrong. Uh, we should be living in a kind of country where people have got freedom of expression and an understanding of each other. And uh, th these sort of attitudes just strengthen my resolve. They don't diminish them. Two weeks ago, Scotland held its first ever national summit on sectarianism. More than 30 organisations, including the leaders of Scotland's main churches, schools, the Orange Order and both Rangers and Celtic, gathered together to debate tackling the issue of religious bigotry. This unprecedented meeting of minds was chaired by Jack McConnell, the First Minister. I don't want people to be ashamed of the traditions, but when that spills over into hatred of another religion, hatred of another community, then that is what is wrong. And it's the public expression of offensive behaviour, the public expression of offensive language, offensive marching, uh, the, the public hatred of others, uh, and the encouragement in younger generations to feel that way too, that I think is most offensive in Scotland, and that is what we have to change. <laughs> Another victim of the violence which so often occurs on the day of Old Firm matches. His injuries weren't serious, but over the last 10 years, it's estimated there have been at least 10 sectarian murders linked to Old Firm rivalry, and in that time, hundreds of assaults. It's based on prejudice, it's based on ignorance, it's based on pure badness. Uh, but whether it's uh, because you wear a particular football top or because of your particular faith or because you're a particular colour, uh, you know, these some things for, for reasonable people uh, like, like you and I uh, and, and the vast majority of, the, of people in the United Kingdom, it's very, very difficult to understand. If you were a Martian uh, and you, you came upon uh, the setting of Rangers or Celtic on a, on a Saturday afternoon, if you were suddenly parachuted into Ibrox and you heard this going on, you heard the venom, you heard the rancid chanting, you, you heard the ignorant, uneducated, prejudiced sentiment that came from the terracings, you really would think, God, oh, this is a savage society. This is Polmont Young Offenders Institution. It holds some of Scotland's most violent young men. Many are from backgrounds where sectarian values are actively encouraged. Among them are die-hard Celtic and Rangers fans. I started to understand, maybe when I was about 10, what the words meant. Um, for the, where the Catholics and Protestants divided, it used like obscene words against the Protestants. 
and Such that. I started to like, um, Protestant scum and dirty orange bastards and all that, which drums that into your head. And that, that's the way you begin to feel yourself. At the age of ten? At the age of ten, aye. My first ever memory was going to visit my uncle in, in prison and getting a, a Rangers top off him. That's, that's the only memory I can remember. Now, drumming into my head about Rangers, how to hate the Fenians, the Fenians Celtic. Whether my team won, drew or lost, I would come out and I would end up going and picking a fight with Rangers, a guy with a Rangers tap on. Well, was that because they were Rangers or was that because they were Protestants? Rangers and Protestants. Tell you the truth, I, I didn't really know what Fenian meant at the time, but I took it on board anyway because you're going to take it on board what your uncles not are saying, you know what I mean? Because it's like your elders. When you used to read about fans being attacked or murdered after games and you read that it was maybe a Rangers fan it had happened to, what would you think? No, I used to think, good, one less Rangers fan. One less Protestant. One less of them to go supporting the at Green. Whereas if I read if it was a Celtic fan, I'd put that dirty proddy scum, you know what I mean? Bastards. For, for doing that to one of, one of us. Deeply ingrained attitudes make life difficult for those who deal with the aftermath of an old firm match. Call-outs to paramedics can increase by up to 66%. The vast majority, violent or drunken assaults between opposing fans. Staff often experience the sectarian hatred first-hand. Our nurses wear blue, our doctors wear green, some surgeons wear blue, and this may not be the colour of choice of the individuals who will be treated in the night. And there'd be an endless argument to calm them down, sort them out just so you can treat them. So an injury that takes yeah. five minutes to stitch, it's an hour and it's three persons yeah. trying to calm this guy down. Yeah, pe people do sometimes yeah. take great exception to inane little things like that and, uh, you know, it's totally absurd. I think anyone outside the, the west of Scotland just wouldn't understand it at all. But it's, it's been like that, you know, certainly the whole of my life uh, that I can remember. Yeah. Rangers and Celtic may just be football clubs, but like it or not, they've been put at the heart of this very public sectarian debate. Being in the media spotlight hasn't always been easy for them. Paul Gascoigne celebrates a Rangers goal by imitating a loyalist flute band. Donald Finlay, high-profile barrister and vice chairman of Rangers, leading sectarian singing. Celtic manager Martin O'Neill endorsing an anti-sectarian initiative. You personally think you can do anything at Celtic Park to stop it, the singing, the sectarian chanting from the, the stands? Who? Hey. You. Could you make an appeal to the people who do this to tell them to stop it? Well, I, I, I know you, you're asking me, could I make an appeal? Um, do you think that would be heard if we were 3-0 down at home in a game? <laughs> you know? It, you know. It, it, that might be quite difficult, you know. I would say that the, fair, the chanting would probably be levelled at me, to be perfectly honest. You, know? you want to sidestep this issue, really, is it? Pardon? You want to sidestep it at the ground? That's what I'm saying, that there is sectarian no. chanting going on at the ground, but you don't want to address it yourself personally. You're asking me that question? I'm asking that question. Are you? Is it, how, how, it's an issue for what, you as a manager what, with, with fans chanting sectarian songs. Do you think you should be addressing that uh, problem? Well, you tell me. All right, I'm asking the me. question. No, no, you're no, but you, you've obviously got an answer to it, so you'd let me know. I don't have an answer. You're the well, manager of the football. I don't have an answer. Either. Celtic manager Martin O'Neill's claim that his midfield player Neil Lennon was a victim of racist and sectarian abuse during Saturday's Old Firm game. Three years later, for Mr O'Neill, things now seem a little clearer. He was uh, he was verbally abused. In, uh, in a racial and uh, sectarian manner. And the Rangers manager's response today to the accusations? I'm here only to talk about the Austria game. So if there are any other questions, I'll, I'll refuse to answer them. The dilemma is how to break the generational cycle of bigotry and violence. Both clubs invest in educational projects. These children are from Catholic and Protestant schools across the city. For them, a tour around the stadiums and the chance to meet some of their heroes. For the clubs, it's an opportunity for them to tackle attitudes on religious bigotry within the next generation of fans. Hands up if you're a football fan then. OK, so lots of football fans around. Children don't really 
are not really sectarianism because they usually just get on with their friends and that, even if they do support Rangers Celtic. It's like probably teenagers and adults. The project ends with the children, a mix of Rangers and Celtic fans, watching the old firm game together. The really important thing is that whatever else you do, when you're travelling to the match, nobody but nobody will wear their football colours. Your football colours you can bring with you. You have them in a bag that you cannot see through, right? Now, why do you think we do that? OK, Charlie. So there's no fights, right? Whatever we've talked about, whatever we've covered in these two days, what is really clear is that the old firm match, the atmosphere in the city is going to be quite high. Inevitably, sectarianism has spawned its own language. Words and names used to antagonise and provoke. This alphabet was compiled by these 12-year-olds. A, aggression. B, bigotry and bitter. Bullying. C, Celtic, clueless. D, discrimination. E, envy. F, Fenian. An Irish Republican revolutionary. In Scotland, though, it's used as a derogatory term for a Catholic. G, green, H. Hatred, Hun. A fourth century tribe of Asian warriors. In the First World War, slang for Germans. In Scotland, a disparaging term for a Protestant, a Rangers supporter. R. Religion. S. Sectarianism. T. Tim. Tim wasn't in the Oxford Dictionary. But in Glasgow, it's a Catholic, usually accompanied by an expletive. But would people find words like these offensive? I'm going to give you a list of words. You just tell me when you find some of them offensive and tell me why. OK. Fenian. Aye, that's offensive. Fenian. That's not very nice. Tim. That's not very nice either. Tim. That would be offensive. Tim. Uh, to me, that's just a Celtic supporter. I don't know what it means. Tim. Well, it doesn't really worry me. I mean, a Tim, to my mind, is an Irishman, the same as a jock as a Scotsman. Hun. Oh, no, no. Hun. Just a ranger supporter, I don't know what it means. Oh, no, I don't like the word Hun. Why should you call it even... Why should you even call a German a Hun? It's not a very nice expression at all. But the provocation isn't confined to religious abuse. Celtic fans have a striking line in political songs. A particular favourite is the boys of the old brigade. When you come to games at Celtic Park now, you will have to listen very hard to hear any song sung which have got religious uh, content, which are sh indications of religious bigotry and intolerance. It doesn't happen. But what about the songs with political overtones, Boys of the Old Brigade? We don't like that. We think it's, it's got nothing to do with Celtic Football Club. We have no political affiliation of any kind at all. We think it's out of place at Celtic Park. Last week, a number of fans were clearly heard on live television, disrupting a minute silence for victims of September the 11th. IRA chants could be clearly heard. And it was those songs that led the chief executive to send a letter saying, this is no place in our club, we don't want it. We will not defend them. We think they're doing the wrong thing and we want to discourage them from coming to Celtic Park. Just a week after the strongly worded letter was sent to fans, the same political songs could be heard again. The game's now 20 minutes old and Celtic have scored their first goal. The fans have barely stopped singing for the whole of the match and the words IRA could clearly be heard in the first five minutes, sending a note of defiance to the Celtic board. 
Both clubs argue, although they've some control over their home support, it's when their fans travel to away fixtures that it becomes more difficult. People who go to the away games and who are more numerous, certainly noisier at the away games than at the home games, are not season ticket holders. Now, you can withdraw a season ticket if a person owns one. If they don't own a season ticket, there is limitations to what you can do. So, what can you do? Nothing, well, you it can, seems. You can work with the other clubs. You could try and assist them before the match day. You can have a relationship with the local police. You can send stewards to the ground to try and make sure there's the good behaviour. But as I say, the responsibility for conduct inside the ground is ultimately that of the home team. Today, the Irish rebel songs still continue. This is Celtic's away support filmed by us in the first two months of this year. Rangers fans too have a way of using expressions of extreme political beliefs to provoke the other side. We filmed these fans repeatedly making Nazi salutes and singing sectarian songs. I think that uh, we have some singing that is unacceptable, we have some actions that are unacceptable and uh, we're working hard at all times to endeavour to eradicate them. Have you seen the salute that they made? No, not specifically, no. You haven't seen it? No. Every game I've been to, there's Maybe been, you're looking for there's it. been hundreds I have, of fans. I, I go to the football match to watch the football, and if an incident's reported to me, I can comment on it, but I don't see these things, no. Many will tell you that they're not really doing a Nazi salute, there's something they're doing. They're doing a red hand of Ulster, which is another argument for another day about trying to keep the United Kingdom you, united and, and, and all sorts of problems with, with Northern Ireland. But the vast majority of them are 90 minute bigots. I wouldn't believe for one minute that all the numbers that, that, that do that are, are real bigots or, or real racists. What would be the message to the fans who on Sunday's game stood in the terraces in their thousands and sang the most offensive vile, hateful songs and chants, out and out religious hatred. Mm -hmm. What will you say to those fans? I would say sing your songs by all means, but if you put an anecdote of religion or bad language or stuff like that, I say it's totally unacceptable. Did you hear these fans? Of course I did. I'm not denying, but I think that... Are you not ashamed of them? No, what I've said is it's totally unacceptable. Are you not ashamed of them, though? I wouldn't use the word ashamed, I'd just say it's totally unacceptable. I think that, that there's no place for that in society today. There is a very phony debate going on among some supporters who try to justify their, their chanting. I met a member recently uh, uh, of the Ranger Supporters Trust, a supposedly progressive, modern forward-thinking fans movement. Well, you know, he said, the Fenian word, you know, you have to understand its political context. I said, look, do not insult my intelligence and your intelligence by pretending that the vast ranks of the Rangers fans who are singing Dirty Fenian Bastard are all mid-19th century political historians who are concerned with political dissent in Ireland. Of course they're not. By Fenian, they mean Catholic, and that's what they mean. Another young victim caught up in the bloody aftermath of last week's Old Firm game. He'd been in a pub watching the game somewhere else, had walked along the street, come to another pub to meet his friends, and a fight had broken out within the pub, and uh, he'd had a broken glass put in his eye. There's a lot of violence after an Old Firm game. You could be lucky, you're lucky to get home if you're wearing a particular colour intact. It's as simple as that. Soldiers are we whose lives are pledged to Ireland. Some have come from a land beyond the way. But the games that I've been here have been the best adrenaline buzz you could not, not one drug could experience you. The adrenaline for you, you know what I mean? You just get that much high. That's how I think there's that many murders and stabbings and all the rest of it because you're leaving the games in such a high 
you're not really thinking about the consequences before you go and do something. Are you surprised by the level of violence after these football games? No, really, no. Nobody's stuff that gets shouted at you. It, it gets us really mad. That's, that's how people get hurt. That's how people end up getting murdered. That's, that's a cause of it. They come out of the grounds, it, it hates building up in you, you're starting to, you're getting really, really mad. And it gets to the stage where you're saying to yourself, if first Rangers fan I see you, I'm just going to run up to them. Rangers is the only club in Scotland to have set up a sectarianism and racism monitoring group. We were invited to one of their fortnightly meetings. One of the items on the agenda was a debrief on the old firm game in January, which we'd secretly filmed at. Policy of plain clothes stewards. Uh, and broadly speaking, I'm pleased to, to say that uh, the behaviour was very good. Well, admittedly, there was no violence, but could this really have been the same game that we attended? We managed to capture on camera numerous Rangers supporters giving Nazi salutes and singing sectarian songs. I have said on many, many occasions that I don't think we really have a, a huge racist problem in the west of Scotland. I don't think we have a huge sectarian problem, but we do sometimes have a problem of big mouth, and that's what the 90-minute bigot tends to be, is, is someone who's shouting something loud, but that he doesn't really mean it. Well, I think when a young man can have his throat cut and bleed to death just because of the colour of a scarf or a top he's wearing, that's not 90-minute bigotry. That's a lifetime of bigotry and several generations of bigotry just demonstrating itself. And it's certainly not just a 90-minute episode. That's it in a nutshell, really. The violent aftermath of the Old Firm match last week pushed crisis-hit hospitals to the verge... One nurse said that Sunday night, like any other Old Firm day, was like a bloodbath. Statistics just a spokesman down. said the incidents after Saturday's game were horrendous and show once again the desperate need for urgent action. What action would you take against a fan who's been deemed to be singing or chanting something which is unacceptable in the club's eyes, something sectarian? We pursue it. Uh, as vigorously as the law permits. If that points us toward a season ticket holder or a supporter who's been, first of all, charged with sectarian behaviour, we suspend his entry to the ground, take away his season ticket. And if he's convicted of sectarian behaviour, we can take away the ticket, and we do so, and that's an indefinite suspension. How many people have you taken that action against? This year, one. Because, as I said, only one conviction has been achieved in his courts of sectarian behaviour. If you lived in Glasgow 20, 30, 40 years ago, there were hundreds of arrests at games. And fighting would break out in the terrace, and bottles would be thrown. Now, measured in an historical context, I think we've made very, very considerable strides in Celtic's policy to continue with that effort to try and reduce and, if possible, eliminate sectarian behaviour at Celtic Park. For seven years, Rangers have been collecting data on their own offending fans. We've given 14 life bans, 110 told not to come back, and there's been over 1,200 warnings. We're working at it. How many of those numbers were banned or identified for sectarian behaviour? I cannot be specific on that because you'd have to ask Lawrence that, who I believe you've interviewed. I've asked him and he can't answer that question either. Well, if you want us to go and find out before you put this programme, we'll give you the exact number, but I'm sure there was a, a vast majority would be of that. Do you think it would be worth it for the club to actually try and find out the scale of the problem by trying to identify how many of these fans have committed these Well, I think problems. I've already said to you, we're working around the clock. We can only do so much. It's not just a problem with Rangers and Celtic or football in general. It's a social situation that has been in Scotland for years, which I think has been overblown up. We asked again for the number of fans penalised by the club for sectarian behaviour. They couldn't establish this, they said, because of data protection. This 16-year-old boy was attacked by Celtic fans as he stood at a bus stop near his home after last week's game. We've just had a, a chat there, a young boy, 16, 
who to the outside world looks like a, a Rangers fan. He's wearing red, white and blue from top to toe. And when we uncovered him to expose and examine him, he's wearing a Celtic top underneath. Now, that wouldn't have been seen by a passerby. But he's de absolutely determined it's a, a supporters issue. He's, he thinks he was attacked because of the colours he wears. Policing last weekend's old firm match was a major operation. With 60,000 fans expected to attend, it's treated as a Category A major incident. There'll be more than 500 officers involved in policing it. Now they also have the added burden of having to enforce the new law on bigotry. People often refer to this 90-minute bigot. Well, you know, whether you're a 90-minute bigot or a bigot 24 hours a day, if you come and commit a religious prejudice crime at a football match, our view, my view, is that uh, you should be arrested and, and, and that's, that's the stance we've taken. We cannot just simply say too many people are doing it, it's too hard, I'm going to turn a blind eye. We have to go in and take some form of action and I suppose uh, perhaps go for, for those who are the worst offenders, those who are the most obvious, those who are the most outrageous, those who are the ringleaders and that type of thing. And you come and take your seats. One group of football fans who won't see any of this are the 30 youngsters from the Sense Over Sectarianism project. They change into their team strips after they arrive at the stadium because it's too dangerous for them to travel in their colours. They're also segregated from the crowd for their own safety and watch the game in one of the club's canteens. It's been a fairly typical uh, morning for a no firm match. There's been two arrests uh, uh, so far. And what were they arrested for? For, for a breach of the peace with a religious prejudice attached to that. And that was already this morning? Yeah, just in, in, in the stadium, uh, just before kick-off, yeah. And do you anticipate there'll be many more? Well, I hope not. I hope everybody listens to what uh, the clubs have told them. We are the Bally Boys! In total, there were 30 arrests after the game. 12 for sectarian offences, one for racism. Um, you can either sit on your backside and do nothing about it and accept that nothing will ever change, or you can try and change attitudes by encouraging the next generation because that's the real focus here, the next generation, uh, a different set of attitudes, is far more tolerant and understanding, uh, and therefore reduces the amount of violence and intimidation that takes place. The political will is there, so too is the law. But what of the clubs? How they exercise their considerable influence over their support could be a major factor in determining when Scotland will finally be rid of its secret shame. You have the drama of the game itself and the atmosphere. And yes, if you ignore the specific sentiment, if you ignore the bigoted vocabulary, yes, it's an exciting environment. But my point is, down the nexus chain, there is death at the end of it. You have the passion, you have the tribalism, you have the aggro out in the street, you have the policing, you have the fighting, and down the line, you have tragedy. What kind of results have you seen this evening? Um, at least one, two, three people have been slashed in the face. Uh, a barmaid who was um, injured got caught in a crossfire. So there, there are a mixture of people who've been picked out because they're, they're an obvious sectarian target, and other people are just innocent bystanders, people even just at the work and injured. Now, it's still quite early, it's 2 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. You've obviously been on shift for a number of hours, but you've yeah. got the rest of the night. How do you expect the evening to pan out? Well, it's difficult to give precise figures. Um, we've got a list here from the computer, and we know we've had 14 assaults in before midnight. Um, and that's, that's a high number for a weekend. There are also 21 other injuries. Once again, that's a profile of 20 to 40 year old males. So there could be assaults that have been hidden. At the end of the day, you could be talking about. 40 patients have all, been, all come here as a result of um, sectarian problems.
Next week on Panorama, the dollar a day dress. We visit three continents to make an outfit which shows how unfair trade keeps millions in poverty, and we model it on the London catwalk. If you want to comment on this week's programme, visit our website at bbc.co.uk slash panorama.